the moment, the ambulance system is totally overloaded. And there was an article in the Saturday paper yesterday about that. So the system is really at breaking point. The federal government is throwing a lot of money at it and they're putting um, normal patients, if you put them that way, into private hospitals. Patients who are not COVID are going into private hospitals, highly subsidised. The federal government subsidised private hospitals early in the pandemic when they expected lots of cases. They were basically emptied and paid to stay empty in case we needed them. So the government at a federal level is throwing a lot of money at the problem, basically, so that you can't see the, the fundamental problems within the health system and the increasing privatisation of everything and the running down of Medicare are uh, really serious health problems that are being swept under the carpet, I believe, by, by sort of, uh, what you say, random grants might be a way of, of putting it in terms of the federal government's policy. The key point about the lockdown is, and, and I think this is probably the message that's the take home from this talk as a whole, is that vaccination really can't cut it alone. And there's a graph uh, which I want to show you. Now, this is a graph of what will happen to the numbers of Delta patients. Now, the R number that you see at the top there, it's a Delta variant is a type of COVID, which is more infectious than the previous ones. It's a general property of viruses that the more virulent one, that is to say the one that gets from one patient to the next fastest, will outcompete the viruses that get to the next patient more slowly. So the Delta variant is more infectious, right, or more virulent, as they call it. That R number is the number of patients that come from each patient. So if one patient produces six other cases, that's an R number of six. Right. Now, if nobody comes in contact with anybody, right, you, the maximum lockdown, if you look at the blue line down there, the R number is 1.2. So each person infects 1.2 people. That's with only public health measures. In other words, you keep people from getting anywhere near anybody else as much as you can, and not many people get next to anybody so that the people don't get sick. If you then add vaccines, which means that they transmit it less and carry it, you have less cases, this muddy khaki one goes down there. The R number gets less than one. Once the R number is less than one, the total number of cases will decline. Once the number is above one, each case will infect more than one other case, and so the number of cases will slowly rise. And the size of the R number is how steep the rise is. And you can see it always gets more and more steep because it's a geometric progression. Two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16. Each time it doubles, it doubles bigger, right? So that is with public health measures. Now, if you have vaccines only, in other words, you let people breathe on each other, which is what it boils down to, even with 80% of the total population vaccinated, if the vaccine is 60% efficient at um, making people not get sick, the graph goes up like that. And if you see the difference in vaccines only compared to public health measures, if you've got 80%, 85% of the total population vaccinated, you've effectively got 15% of them not vaccinated, right? And 15% is quite enough to transmit to people. So if someone goes out there, 15% of the people he or she meets will be able to be infected and some of the others will be infected as well, although they won't get sick you get a massive increase. The R number goes up to 2.9. If you've only got 64% of the population vaccinated, it go, the R number becomes 3.7. So you have a very rapid rise. So the people who think that vaccines can replace public health measures should look at this graph and see that it is an absurd proposition. Right? You need public health measures and vaccines. And of course, you'll see these two graphs, one's at 64% vaccinated, the other one's 85. They still go up very steeply because there's still a lot of people not vaccinated. Now, if we look at Australia's vaccination rate, basically Australia's vaccination rate is 93 doses per 100 people, according to the WHO. In other words, we've had 93 doses for each 100 people, which means on average, we've got less than one dose per person. 71% of the over 16s have had one dose, but that's only 57% of the whole population. 
you can't ignore the under 16s because they're great little spreaders. If the kids go off to school, a lot of them will get infected because they'll they'll be socially uh, probably more in contact with each other than, than at the average workplace. And they'll bring it home. If you've ever had a kid and the kid's gone to daycare, the minute the kid goes to daycare, the parents get every cold in the whole country because the little kid gets it from the other kids and brings it home. And of course, it's an intimate relationship you have with your kids. So if you've got an isolated home, but your kid goes to school, you have a wonderful conduit for the virus so that when you say 71% of the other 16s are vaccinated, you've effectively got 30% not vaccinated. And then you've got 57% of the population as a whole not vaccinated with the kids spreading it. So it's very irresponsible. It's been 43% of the population have had no vaccine. It's simply not enough people. We've got 46% of the over 16s vaccinated, 46%, which is 37% of the population have had two doses, which is means 63% have either had no dose or one dose. Now that is not enough protection, quite simply. And if you go back to the previous graph, the idea that a vaccine can replace public health measures is absurd. And even with very high vaccination rates, you'll still get a big climb. And I think we have to go a bit longer. And of course, the thing stopping us locking down is that the government has abolished job keeper and job seeker at a, at a realistic level. And the people who are most affected are the essential workers who, of course, often live paycheck to paycheck and haven't got any money. So effectively, it's the government's unwillingness to subsidise it for a bit longer and they want to open it, which saves them subsidising and supposedly helps the budget. The cost of treating somebody is horrendous. The cost in intensive care of a person is extremely expensive, not to mention that they may die. And even if you look at the cost, it's extraordinary. Um, and the, the labour intensiveness, and I mean, you've got a 10% long COVID rate, so that if somebody gets sick with COVID, 10% of them will have ongoing problems with their lungs, and sometimes with their memory, with depression. Um, the idea of simply saying, oh, well, we've got enough intensive care beds, we've got to open up sooner or later. We should wait until the vaccination rate is absolutely as high as we can. I think we should wait until the kids are vaccinated too. And I don't think that's impossible. If we can vaccinate a million people a week in New South Wales, it'd take four or five weeks to get all the people who are willing to be vaccinated, vaccinated. My own view is it should be compulsory. When I worked in New Zealand, I was going to work in Dunedin Hospital and they said, have you had all your vaccines? And I said, mm, I think so. Where's your certificates? Where, where's your record? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe. And they said, no, no, well, if you, you know, you better have more. So they just said, well, well no vax, no job, basically. And, and that was regarded as 100% normal. And this idea that it's your civil right to be infectious is, is absurd, really, I think. And um, if someone said, oh, you've got, you, you don't have to wear a seatbelt if you don't want to, it's an invasion of your private space. Well, that argument was had in the 1960s. And in 1970, Victoria was the first jurisdiction in the world to make seatbelts compulsory. It's all been accepted. The fascists haven't marched any faster because seatbelts are compulsory. So the idea that it's a thin end of a wedge, I think, is a nonsense argument. Yes, it does involve some personal risk, but the risk, the right to infect somebody is much less important than the right not to be infected. Um, we had this argument with passive smoking, but this is much, much worse than passive smoking in that it's not transient. It's, it's a permanent long-term infection that may kill the next person. So, and of course, the, the masks reduce spread of um, small particles of liquid by about 85%. So the masks mostly help people who are infected not spread it to other people. The spread back the other way is only reduced about 15%. If it's in the air, the only, it, won't, it won't stop it coming in as well as it stops it going out because the droplets all end up inside the mask. So masks are very important also and must be ignored, but staying at home and staying distance is very important. So this rush to open things is, is very worrying. I think, yep, yeah, if you look at the political situation, I think it's, it's, um, it's the big end of town telling the government what to do. And I think it's an extremely foolish thing and we'll, we'll end up in, 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 a, in a disaster. I think we'll, over, we'll overdo the capacity of the health system for 
basically uh, an unwillingness to hold on a bit longer. 